and I introduce to you none other than Evangelist J. Anthony Allen. Praise the Lord. First of all, I want to give honor to the Spirit of God, which is in this place, uh, giving honor to the angel of the house, Dr. Angela Powell, thanking her for the opportunity to allow me to minister from Archangels International Ministries. I greet you all in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for this privilege and opportunity. With that being said, I also want to add this as a footnote. I want to give a happy Father's Day out to every father, no matter where you are in life, no matter what your status is, no matter what your condition consists of. I want to give honor to you today for being a father. And I won't be before you very long, but I have a couple of scriptures that I want to share with you. And somewhere inside of this message, I I'm truly understand why uh, Dr. Powell invited me to come or to speak to you today because he started to wake up a whole lot of stuff inside of me Amen. where I came from. And I'm going to give you two scriptures that I'm going to use today. And I'm going to tie this thing up and then we're going to end it and we're going to go home. How about that? The first scripture that I want to give is from Jeremiah chapter one through five. It says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet among the nations. The scripture comes from Romans 8 and 28. And it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And I, I would like to use for a topic today, if you remember nothing else, just remember this. There is a method to the madness. Trust what I'm telling you, there is a method to the madness. And in doing that, I wanted to visit one of the patriarchs from the Bible by the name of David. Most of you are familiar with the conquest that he had when he went up against Goliath and how that he killed Goliath and took his head and so on and so forth. And throughout the years, David had a whole lot of feats that he accomplished, believe it or not. And I know some of you may not be avid Bible readers, but it really doesn't matter. But if you can just think back and think about some of the things that you may have heard over the years concerning this great man of God, and you would take those things and use them in your life, I can promise you it would be beneficial to bless you to get to the place that you truly need to be. And what I want to do today, realistically, I want to speak to the men. There may be some women watching this show, but I want to speak to the men. And I'm talking about those guys that are jacked up, the guys that are out there in the world that just feel like your all hope is gone, that nobody cares anything about you. I want to talk to all of those forlorn individuals that just feel like their whole world is upside down. It seems like that everything that you've tried in life, you bounce from one wall to the next and you can't get ahead. But the reality of it is you need to know that God ultimately has your back. And one thing about it is, regardless of where you are and what you're going through, God has always been there. And I know some may be saying right now, if he was there, why wouldn't he do this? Why wouldn't he rescue me from this situation? Why did he allow me to get into that situation? The Bible says that in him we move and we breathe and have our being. It was not the alarm clock that woke you up this morning, but it was God that touched you, that got you up. And the reality of it is, that he has always been there no matter what. The reality of it is, is this. All of us weren't born with silver spoons in our mouths. Some of us were born into struggle. And I know some of you can relate to what I'm talking about. Maybe yes. in situations that uh, were beyond your control to the degree that you might have been born in a crack house. You might have been born in an outhouse. You might have been born in a garbage, but the reality yeah. is God has always been there. The key is, just like Jeremiah said, before you were even formed in the belly of the womb, he already knew your name. He knew your name even before your parents gave you a name. The reality of it is, is God has always had intent and purpose. And that's the focal point that you need to focus on today is that there is a purpose that you have in your life. It doesn't matter that you don't come from the aristocratic side of the house. You can come from the outside of the house, 
But the reality of it is, is that God has always been there. It wasn't happenstance that King Jesus wasn't born in a White House. He was born in a manger to allow all of us the opportunity to be able to get to him. How many people do you know that would name a king? Just think about it, that they would deem the king of the universe who's born in a manger with animals and everything else that are around him. The reality of it is he did that with intent and purpose because it didn't keep us, people like us, from getting inside. Can you imagine if there were people who were born that were in an aristocratic setting that sometimes you can't even get past the gate? Maybe you've been in situations in life where you couldn't get past the gate, where the reality of it is, is that you wanted to be a part of a system, but realistically, you weren't a part of the system. You were only the person that was always on the outside looking in. But again, God had purpose and intent, and we're going to go somewhere. Just stay with me. We're going to tie this thing up in a minute. It's going to make a whole lot of sense. But God had you where you were so that you could develop the sensitivity that's needed to bring people just like you to where he is. Because there aren't a whole lot of sensitive people in the world. And I know as some Christians nowadays, they don't even want to watch the news. Sad to say, because they get tired of hearing all of the things that's going on throughout the world. Devastations here, hurricanes there, wars there. The reality of it is you need to hear it. Because those are the things that God is tweaking you with to get you to come to a point where you are called to general quarters so you can position yourself to be able to snatch others out from the situations that they're in. It does not matter where people are. Oftentimes when I travel and I see people, and I'm sure you've seen them yourself, standing out there with signs that they've handmade looking for help. Now I know there are a few people that may think that everybody that's looking upon them think those people are just on drugs and just trying to acquire money but the reality of it is some of those people aren't on drugs and maybe have never been on drugs, but they're on the underside of life. And right now they're doing whatever it takes to survive. I'm again from Georgia and there's a place downtown in the main street on Georgia, Peachtree. You can go down there any time of the year and you'll see people littered all across the lines, laying out in the grass. Some oh my God. sleeping bags. Some of them are just bundled up. And I'm going to tell you what, they just look like poor trash. The reality of it is. Mm -hmm. Ever took a moment to talk to some of those individuals, you would realize that some of them were doctors. Some of them were lawyers. Yes. Some of them were politicians. And life flipped them upside down. And they just don't know how they're going to get it back and how they're going to pull it together. The My God. Of it is, there are people like that throughout the world. If you know people that have money. We're going to talk about financial folks now. When they get into situations and they get on drugs, we'll just use that as an example. They send them off to centers and try to get them through rehab and everything else. But then you got the same people or other people that are doing the same things that they're doing and they're labeled as crackheads. They're labeled as derelicts of society and looked upon like they're nobody to be dealt with. But the reality of it is, is the condition is the same. And what God wants to do is get in the middle of that mess and break it up. Looking at David's life, let's talk about him for a moment. One of the things I thought about is where David came from. David was a shepherd. And that's one of, I would say, one of the lowliest positions that they probably had back in that day. He was the eighth son of Jesse. And he was out there tending his father's sheep. David had brothers that were warriors that actually fought with uh, King Saul on occasion. And here David is, is just some little kid that's out there running around, rambling around. This is the word I'm going to use. My grandmother used to say all the time, just picking up the pieces here and there. And every time somebody needed something, he was the one that they told to go fetch. Never thought about that, but I can guarantee that's who he was. Because he's out there doing what he's doing. And there was a day that God spoke to the prophet Samuel, and he said, I want you to go down to Jesse's house. And he wanted to know why. And he said, because there's a king there that I want you to anoint. Well, he did so, and he did it with a little bit of apprehension for the simple fact that King Saul had ever found out 
that he was going to anoint someone, someone he could have been killed instantly. People don't really think of that. He could have been killed just for the action that he took. So he went to Jesse's house, just like God told him. And Jesse started to present all of his stellar sons, if you know what I mean. The big guys, the soldiers, the one you look like they were going to be all of that. And then, then some, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he started to pass one son from another before Jesse. And every time Jesse would take the horn of oil to pour it, the oil never ran. And it came to a point where Samuel asked Jesse, he said, I've done this with seven of your sons and nothing is going on. Do you have any more children? Here's Jesse. He said, you know what? I do have a son that's out there tending the sheep. He said, well, maybe you need to send for him so he can come up here and let me have a discussion with him. And as soon as David walked up in front of Samuel, he poured the horn of oil and it just went all over the place. Now, let me give you something here. It's not that same anointing that we do in church where we take that little speck, you know what I'm talking about, and put it in the middle of somebody's forehead. Mm -hmm. Literally poured the oil on him till the oil ran down his face. God, yes. He was saturated with this oil. I'm speaking on this because I'm going to go somewhere with this. Hallelujah. We are. But he anointed him to be a king over Israel. And right after that, he probably cleaned himself up a little bit and went right back out there and started tending his father's sheep. Sometimes I think people want to put the cart in front of the horse, if you will, mm -hmm. anyone else. And he told them that he was going to be anointed to be the king. He might have been trying to figure out how to jump in the second chariot and everything else in order to go to the plateau where God was taking him to. But David had an humble spirit, and he went right back out there doing what he needed to do. But then there were a couple of occasions that I want to point at. David was out there tending his father's sheep. And during one of those courses, there was a time that a lion came in and snatched one of them up. Preach. Mm -hmm. David took and went and he actually killed the lion and retrieved the lamb. Amen. Me thinking like myself, and I'm thinking about lions or any other animal as far as that's concerned. If I saw one lion going after one sheep and I could leave the uh, keep the other 99 protected, I'm probably going to keep the 99 protected and let the uh -huh. one. <laughs> Not David. He went out there and he retrieved that sheep and brought that sheep back to the fold. Now, that was just one occasion. There was another occasion where a bear attacked a one of the lambs. And again, I would have left that sheep going, kept on going, but not David. He went out there, killed the bear, took that sheep back all over again. And the reality of it is, is something was going on in David's life that I'm sure he wasn't even aware of. Because not only was David anointed to be a king over Israel, but he was also anointed to be protected. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about how you've been up against the wall and in certain situations that other people would have lost their minds and other people have been killed or destroyed, but they are still there? It's only because of God's anointing. There were some things that people were supposed to see. I call it, you can be up close and personal, but still not be engaged in it. Things that David had to deal with, even in his own household. I know sometimes Brothers and sisters don't always get along. You know what I'm talking about? And David, I'm pretty sure being the run of the family, and that's what I'm going to call him, he probably didn't get along with all his brothers at all the times. And the key is they probably looked at him like, okay, that's our little brother. We love him, but you know, you just stay over there and we'll go out and we'll do whatever it is we need to do. But the reality of it is, is God had his attention centered on the run. Because the Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance. Yes. The heart. And that was even a question that probably came up when the oil was being poured upon David, where Jesse said, out of all of my sons, why in the world would you choose this one? And that's the word that Samuel gave to him. He said, because God is not looking at what you're looking at. That's He's right. Something else. And the reality of it is, is, that whatever else he's looking at has already been resident in you because just like in the life of Jeremiah, 
who God knew before he was even formed in the belly, he already had a plan for David's life. He already had uh, him covered and protected and knew what he was going to raise him up to become. And he knew everything about David because ultimately, guess what? God is created. That's right. Thought about that. Have you ever thought about that? I'm not in this thing by myself. I'm not in this world alone. That's and right. Let's move forward here. We know that David went out to take food to his brothers while the Israelites were standing on one mountain and the Philistines were standing on another. And Goliath, who I think was a little over nine feet tall and a, just a big, gigantic guy, he would come down into the field every day telling the Israelites, look, we don't even have to fight a whole war. What you can do is you can pick out the baddest guy you got, and that's the way I'm going to say it, and send him down, and I'll fight him. And if I win, then we automatically win the battle. But if you win, you automatically win the battle. He did this thing for like 40 days. Every day he would go down there cussing and throwing fits and inviting one of the Israelite soldiers to come down to fight with. Not one of them went. So David had a message where he had to deliver food to his brothers that were sent by his father. When he showed up, he overheard what he was saying, and there was a righteous indignation that rose up in him. You ever have righteous indignation rise up in you and why you feeling the Yes. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, to the degree where you can see people that are being uh, oppressed and contemptuous situations. And all of a sudden, something rises up in you and you want to jump in the foray. But the reality of it is, is you just got to kind of sometimes just stand back and let God do whatever it is he wants to do. So, but that being said, David heard what Goliath was saying to the armies of God. And he looked around at all of those guys. It's like, not one of you guys are going out there to fight him. David said, I'll tell you what, let me go. I'll fight him. In my mind's eye, I can only imagine this kid, he was only like 16 or 17 years old, looking out there, talking trash. I'm going to say it this way, talking trash. We're going to bring this to where it, where it really gets <laughs> And threatening, look, I'll come down and fight you. And people are looking at him like he's crazy. Mm -hmm. He called David and said, man, come here, let me talk to you for a minute. I really don't know who you are. He said, but if you are bound and determined to go down and fight that guy, at least put my armor on. You know, yes. the reason why Saul wanted him to put the armor on, it wasn't so much that David would be protected because if David would win by happenstance, Saul could always fall back and say, it's because he had on my arm. That's mm -hmm. what Whereas for 40 days, you've been sitting up here in this tent and not moved not one time. And the Bible said that Saul was head and shoulders taller than every man in Israel. So even though he might not have been as tall as Goliath, if anybody should have been out there in the fight, he should have been out there throwing punches. But David tried the armor on it. It was so big, he couldn't wear it. It was cumbersome. So he made a decision. He said, I'll tell you what, I can't wear this, but I can go out and I can fight with what I know. And he asked, he said, well, what are you going to use? He said, I can use rocks. Sometimes you got to use what you got till you get what you want. Do you feel where I'm coming from? It's not about having a bunch of this or a bunch of that. Sometimes it's the simple stuff because God said he used the things of the world to confound. Yes. Again, that's another thing. I don't know that I'm going to go out here and fight this giant who has a shield bearer in front of him, which means there were two men instead of one. And I'm going out here and fight this guy because of the fact everybody else is intimidated. And here they are trembling, and David is looking at him and can't wait to get out there. Matter of fact, he didn't even have a weapon in his hand when he went. You never thought of that, had you? Because mm -mm. It, as he was walking towards Goliath, that's right, a brook, and picked up five smooth stones, which tells me he had nothing in his hand other than his confidence and trust in God. Hallelujah. The idea of it is sometimes you've got to lose your testimony. Yes. God, yes. God, I'm sure that David probably thought within himself that he had already killed a lion. He had already killed a bear. And who is this uncircumcised Philistine that God won't take care of him? My God. In the interim of doing all of that, David didn't even have to use five stones. He used one. 
one. As soon as he threw the stone, it hit Goliath, and believe it or not, that killed Goliath. It wasn't because he got his head cut off. It's because that stone hit him. He cut his head off as a trophy. And from mm -hmm. then forward, it said that the people started to praise David. David has killed his 10,000s versus Saul killing his thousands. And the reality of it is, is that Saul had bitterness. He had jealousy. Go and ahead. Else. And go ahead. even at that point, know this much, David didn't go to the White House from that point. Mm. Killed that giant, went right back out there and started tending his father's sheep and doing what he did as normal. But there was a day that Saul had a troubling spirit that was bothering him, probably had been that way for some time now. And he couldn't figure out what it was that was going on. And one of Saul's servants who had saw David on the mountainside tending his father's sheep noticed that he was playing a sack button. And he stopped and listened to it for the simple fact that whatever he was playing, it started to soothe his spirit. He didn't even know who David was. But when Saul was going through what he was going through, he said, look, he said, there's a guy that's out there on the backside of the mountain. I don't even really know his name. But all I know is when he plays that music, all of a sudden there's a peace in the atmosphere. And let me tell you something. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's what you do. You ever thought about that? Do you realize that you can just clap your hands and get the victory? You don't have to say nothing. That's it's right. It's a degree of anointing where God uses, again, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And sometimes it's just shutting up, not doing nothing, sitting back and just letting God do what it is that he does. I do it. Ultimately, the battle that you're up against is not your battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. Glory. Mm -hmm. Allowing you to be positioned in a place as a testimony to people because that's who he wants to show himself great in. Whatever you've achieved in life, you didn't do it on your own. God did. All you were is the stand in. You were the, yes. or the actresses, if you will, that stood there and allowed God the opportunity to use you. You are the one to sit on the hill that they're looking at, but it's not you that they're looking at. It's Thank the you, Lord. Hallelujah. Because believe it or not, ultimately people know whether they say it or not, if it had not been for God, the Lord on my side, Lord. is ultimately where David went one day. He said, if it had not been for him on my side, I would have been swallowed up quick. He knew that regardless of what he had accomplished and achieved, had God not been there, he would not even be able to do it. Mm -hmm. He said this for some of you that may have fallen back from time to time. You think just because you stumble and fall that God leaves you laying in the dirt? Uh-uh. Preach. And when I started to fall, he said he gives his angels charge over me, puts angels behind me to catch me, to, yes, glory. to mount me back up. No matter what people might say, no matter what you're going through, you are never alone. The key is sometimes people will make you feel like you're alone and you're all by yourself. Let me tell you something. Ain't nothing wrong with being by yourself. Sometimes that's when God can get the glory out of it. That's right. Amen. You are confused by multitudes of voices, by people telling what you would have, should have, could have done. Sometimes you'll find yourself going off on a whole different track and wonder how you got there simply because that's not the track that God had designed for you to go to. So back to the message. David now is in the house of Saul. He goes there because Saul sent for him. And when he began to play the music, the Bible said that Saul felt a peace come all over him. Jesus. Okay. He only wanted David to appease what was going on with him. That's it. And I said to myself, you know what? David has been anointed to be a king. Mm. But he has no aristocracy in him. He doesn't know which fork to eat with when he sits down at the master's table. He doesn't know how he should go in and how he should come out. What God did is put him in a place where he could be in. Hallelujah. Thank you. If you ever Jesus. thought about it? Simply sometimes you're not just forgotten about, but God needs you to be an understudy in to develop in areas that he can pull the best stuff out of. Preach. With mm. regard to that, let's look at it. God has placed things in you innately. You don't even realize it. they're dormant right now. 
and you wonder why you deal with what you deal with and why you go through what you go through with. Mm -hmm. God is kind of scratching the surface back to bring the best out in you so that the true you can really come out. Mm -hmm. If you've been strapped to the streets and you were on drugs, that was not who you were designed to be. Yes, glory. For purpose and for glory, maybe you're supposed to be an evangelist. Maybe you're supposed to be a prophet. Maybe you're simply supposed to be a great church parishioner. Whatever it is, God has a way, and he's always had his hand on you. You didn't just slip up and get saved. Because no man can come to the Father except that God draws him first. You didn't just make a decision one day when you said, you know what, I'm tired of being tired. No, what you did is you got tired of being tired because God was knocking on the door and he was about <laughs> to down. And at a certain point, you finally said to yourself, enough is enough. Now, let's look at David again. We're not done with him. When he got everything that he needed from Saul, that jealous resentment began to rage through Saul to the degree that he wanted to kill David. One I mean, he was sitting at the table. I don't know if they were eating. I don't know what they were doing. And the Bible said he picked up a javelin and threw it in his direction. And David jumped out of the way and he missed him. And from that point on, he's still a teenager, by the way. He's on the run for the rest of his life. Yes. Of his life, not the rest of his life. Now, David, I'm thinking as a child, what it must have felt like to be chased not just by one man, but by an entire army. Whoa. He was chased by the whole army. I know Saul wasn't the only one after him. Saul got soldiers that said, go do this and go do that. That's right. And bring me that. So he was being chased by a whole army of people who were out to take his life because Saul wanted him dead. And the Bible says that while he was on the run, I'm pretty sure just like most people would consider, he's hiding, jumping here and jumping there, going places. And the Bible said that he went to the cave of a dude. Now, I'm saying to myself, you know, this man, his life is jacked up. If you hiding on the inside of caves, because the reality of it is he probably thinks, you know what? Maybe he won't come to this place. And he's there in a cave hiding because he's trying to preserve his life. But the Bible said that 400 men, not boys, Listen to what I'm telling you, 400 men who were in debt, distress, and discontented gathered themselves under him, went into the cave, and then it said that he became a captain over them. My God. It was a developmental process throughout the whole process. David was anointed to be a king, but guess what? Sometimes we're anointed to do stuff and we don't even know how. That's right. But think of that. You've been anointed and by purpose and appointed and don't know how, but God starts to teach you while you're walking. Mm -hmm. The Bible says this, and this goes for the women too, before I said, the steps of a good man are ordered or directed by God. Mm -hmm. It is not happenstance in some of the situations and circumstances that you came across, that you came across because your gate, every step that you took, God had your back. And even if you get off track, guess what? Because God is omniscient and everything, oh he has already made a way of escape. The way has already been made. Sometimes we slip up, been there and done that. I'm going to talk about me in a minute. We're going to include this thing. Where you get off track and get off center. But the reality of it is sometimes you needed to be off track. Yes. Some things that you could not see sitting up behind stained glass windows. I know that's hitting home with somebody, but you don't, uh -huh. you don't get to see a whole lot of stuff sitting up in the church house. We go to church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all day Sunday. And that's all that we do. But the reality of it is, is that we are to be that city that sits on the hill that's not hit. Sometimes you got to mingle and rub elbows with people. I don't mean you have to do what they do, but you need to get in environments where God can show himself great. Mm -hmm. Don't get back and wait. I mean, I know people with this COVID stuff is running rampant through the land right now. I promise you there are a bunch of Christians and other people as well that are sitting back and saying, you know what, I'm not going outside. How are you going to reach people sitting up in your house bottleneck? <laughs> Preach. About it. 
You're sitting up behind closed doors, scared to go to the grocery store, scared to go next door, don't even want to go to the mailbox. Preach it, hallelujah. Scared that the mailman contaminated the mail and all kind of foolishness. But the reality of it is that same resident anointing that rested upon David, which literally rested upon him, is now inside of you. Have you ever thought of that? You got something inside of you that David didn't even have. He was a great man. He was a man after God's own heart. He said, as the heart chases the water brook, so does my heart pan after thee. Sometimes you got to get in a position where you're chasing God down. You ever thought of it? Well, you just said, you know what? Let me just back myself up and think myself out of this instead of sitting up saying the woe is me and caught up in that syndrome. Some start throwing punches. Now, segue right here, and that's what I'm going to talk about myself. How about that? Growing up as a child, we had a whole bunch of financial struggles, and that's just where I'm going to put it. No whole lot of detail. But I thank God, again, I know this is Father's Day, but I thank God for a godly woman, which was my mother. Amen. Her held things together when she could have readily just got up and walked off. Seven kids struggling like I don't know what from time to time. And she's a young woman with seven kids, but she stayed the course. And the one thing that my mom always would do, and I used to look at her like I was crazy. That's why I told you I was going to give you a little bit of my personal testimony here. Anytime we went up against something, she'd call us together and call us to get on our knees and pray. I'm looking at her like, Mom, is this stuff really working? You ever been there? I'm going to keep it real. I remember I came home one time from school where I'd been chased home, probably beat up half the way by four or five guys. I'm a kid. I walked in the house, clothes torn off of me, bleeding where they done black my eye, busted my lip, and this, this did anything and everything. And I wasn't no bully. I just, this, this was just what they did. I walked in the door, my mother started crying and cleaning me up, washing me off, putting a little alcohol here and putting a little alcohol there and Vaseline everywhere. <laughs> and I remembered after she got me cleaned up, my mother said, come on in here. I said, what? She said, let's pray. So I'm thinking, okay, we're going to pray to God, kill him. Not my mama. My mama got down on her knees, and I'm sitting on my knees right beside her, and I'm praying with her, and she's asking God to bless them. Oh, my God. And I'm looking at my mama because I'm a little bit confused here. I don't know too much about the Bible at this point, but I'm thinking, mama, shouldn't you be saying, God, kill him and take him out and wipe out the whole family and everything else? I'm just keeping it real. But that's not what she did. And I will say she prayed, and it got a little better for that while. But I can tell you what, I had to fight from elementary all the way up to junior high. Don't ask me why. Mm -mm -mm. But I was going from change to change to change. I remember getting chased home one time, on another occasion. And it's not digressing. It's all going to go somewhere. Trust what I'm telling you. I'm going to say it was about eight kids chased me home, eight guys. I was in earshot of my home or so I thought I could see my house and I was screaming for my mama, but she couldn't hear me. And these guys are standing there taking pot shots at me, punching me and saying, which one of us do you want to fight? I'm standing there crying. I don't want to fight none of them, realistically, because I'm scared and I'm thinking that they're going to tear me apart. And one of the guys, I would say he was one of the baddest guys out of that bunch. He picked up rocks and started putting them in between his knuckles and started hitting his hands together. He said, he's going to fight me. Don't ask me where it came from. It must have been God. But I knew if he hit me in the head with one of those rocks, potentially he could kill me. And out of, I'm crying, but I'll tell you what, I dropped my books and went off. And that's just the way I'm going to say it. I beat him so bad that the rest of them started running. With regard to that, sometimes God allows us to get in places like that in order for us to be able to turn pressure into power. Yes, yes. It wasn't about running, and it wasn't about them chasing mm -hmm. 
but it was God developing something on the inside of me to let me know, whatever you do, don't give up. Just put your hands up and start. That's right. Amen. Because when you start to do something that God has anointed you to do, he jumps in and takes over. He just mm -hmm. first punch. You ever think of that? And I'm not talking about physical punches now. I'm just using that as a metaphor to let you know that experiences like that remind me of things that I experienced as a child. And when I get up against the wall, and even though I'm a big guy, still cry from time to time, I reflect back on where I come from and remember the testimony of what God did then. And I say to myself, if he did it, then he can do it now. Hallelujah. And you don't, and just the parallel to that is this. David was on the run from Saul. Didn't even have food to eat. And I know he was at a point of giving up. And the Bible said that he went to the priest and they allowed him to go in and partake of the showbread, which in reality, as a non-priest, he should have dropped dead eating. But not only did he allow him to partake of the showbread, the priest went and took the same sword that he cut Goliath's head off and showed it to David and said, do you need this? Wow. Have you ever thought that sometimes God wants you to think back on something that he's yes, done? Yes, yes, he brought you from. Yeah, don't just look at today. Sometimes today is a very challenging situation, but the key is sometimes you got to reflect back on your own testimony and encourage yourself. That's what David said. He encouraged himself in the Lord. It doesn't matter, again, if you feel like you're under pressure because some things up under pressure it brings out something else. I don't know if you know this, but I'll share this with you. Do you know where diamonds come from? Mm. It comes from coal. Diamonds are not just generated in the earth, and it's coal that's been pressurized to a point that it develops something altogether new. And God is allowing you on occasions, not all the time, to be put in a place where your back is up against the wall to bring out the best in you. Mm-mm-mm. He wants you to start the fight. Don't just, just stand there and put up with it. Lord, how long? Lord, if it be thy will, let me tell you what the will of God mm -mm. is. My God. For being here, even as our soul prospers. He made us to be the head and not the tail, above, above only and not beneath. When you start talking about the will of God, that's the stuff that you rehearse. Don't be over there mealy mouth talking to God about, well, Lord, if you would, could you do this? Preach. Lord's will. <laughs> Let me tell you something. That tell me you might be a Bible, an avid Bible student, but you're reading that thing backwards. There are some things that God has purposed and promised that he wants to do in your life. He's going to do it. He's already doing it. All he wants for you to do is grab on to something and run with. See what I'm saying? Kind of like passing the baton. So with regard to that, the method to the madness is this. See, we got down to where we needed to be. Don't look at your life as just mixed up, confused. Don't just look at the frustration and the contempt that you deal with. Don't just look at the anxieties that you have to go through because all of these things are designed to pressurize you, to bring out the best in you. And even though he wasn't a part of this message, I'm going to bring him in anyway. Y'all know about King Saul. I'm talking about not King Saul, but Saul in the New Testament who the Bible said God had to knock off his high horse, and that's just the way I'm going to say it, to the degree that he knocked him off his high horse and God started to deal with him to the point that he became one of the greatest apostles of the New Testament. But there was a thorn that was left in Paul's flesh that he said, I sought the Lord three times that he might remove this thing from me. And God came back and told him, nope. My grace is sufficient for you because my strength is perfected through your weakness. Have you ever looked at the weaknesses in your life and looked at them as a determining point or a factor of where you're going instead of where you are? Whatever you're dealing with right now, presently in your life, there's a reason for it. And if you just start looking at the negative, stop looking at the negative side of what's going on in your life and start looking at the positive side and say, you know what, if I'm going through this, I must be about to go through something greater on that degree. And I know the Bible says, and the reason why I chose this message that I chose today, a method to the madness, 
Because the scripture says this simply, if the thief be found, he has to restore to you sevenfold. Whatever pressures you are funding, no matter what it is, and let me do some calculations here. If you're going through 10 things, do you realize that you get a seven uh, stage promotion for the one piece you're going through out of those 10 things? So 10 times seven equals seven. Have you ever looked at it that way? Instead of just looking at it one way and saying, because sometimes people are going through a multiplicity of things. It's not just one thing. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's finances. Maybe sometimes, should be told, some folks feel like they're about to lose their mind. But if all of those things are under pressure, start calculating those things by seven for each point that you're going through. And when you come up with that other number, then calculate that bottom number, which is 70 times seven. That's 449, right? I'm sure it is. I can count, I think. I don't even know how to calculate it, but I'm pretty sure. So with the key, there is a method to the madness. Know that you are not in this thing by yourself. And there are other things that can be developed in the cave that you can't get it anywhere else. An isolated place, a place of darkness, a place of confusion, a, pe a place where you feel like you're abandoned and you're all alone. But in the process, and I'm going to end with this, those same guys, I don't know, out of 400 of them that gathered to David, you go further down in the scripture, we're not going to go into that because it's a whole nother message, but there were certain of those guys that became Tachmanite soldiers. The Tachmanites were not the name of a nation. The Tachmanites were guys that were the baddest of the bunch that God raised up. And the key is this. Can you imagine David going through what he's going through as an individual, and then he got to listen to 490 other guys coming to him, talking about what they're going through, trying to keep them separate, trying to build a team from a team of negativity. He's going through all kind of chaos, and the whole time, all he can do is depend on God, and God just keeps on giving him the answers. Here's the conclusion. David is on the run. Some of those men had wives. At a certain point, David even had a wife. They were out fighting one battle, and the Bible said that while they were out fighting the battle, that here again, the Philistines stepped in and raped their land, took all of their wives, took all of their children, took everything, money, finances, and all of that, to the point that when David and his soldiers got back, they became contemptible. A few of them wanted to kill David because they felt like their whole world was gone. But the reality of it is this. David started to seek a word from God and wanted to know, what do we do from this point? And the Bible said that David, God told him, this is what you do. Nothing. Don't chase nobody. Don't run after nobody. Don't do nothing. But when you hear the sound of a going in the top of the trees, that's when I want you to move. The sound of the going is indicative of the wind. The wind is indicative of the anointing. And the reality of it is, is David and them didn't have to do nothing. They started killing each other. And they went in and started to pick up the pieces. So look at your life and realize that there's a method to the madness. And whether you believe it or not, you are actually in a place of recovery, whether you know it or not. And know this, that if God is for you, he is more than the world against you. That's what I have to say today. Hopefully this message has been encouragement to somebody. I'm sitting here sweating now, as you can see. <laughs> but it's okay. Hallelujah. God, I give you all the opportunity to be able to speak to the men and to the women, because this message was centered at the men, but it was directed at everybody. Yes. I'll take something from this. So again, thank God for it. And I'm turning it back over to Dr. Angela Powell. Well, before you turn it back over to me, Pastor, I want you to pray for the men that you just finished talking about that's really going through uh, some of these stages that David went through, and they think that it's never going to change. And I thank God that you even gave uh, the single moms a shout out as well. Pray for those single moms like myself that is trying their best to do the best with raising men in this world too.
Amen. Can you say a prayer for everyone? Yeah. Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us today to be able to declare your word as your ambassador. Father, we ask that from this word that we do takeaways, that you enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we might receive beyond what we see, but receive to the point of what we know, knowing that when you are forced, that you are more than the world against us. I'm asking, Father, that you would strengthen every man and every woman and every child that's here right now. Father, I'm asking you to breathe on them just to give them a room of grace, Father, that they'll be able to accomplish whatever it is that they need to accomplish, that they will hold on to your word and stand on your promises, knowing that when you're with them, they are never alone. I'm asking that you would strengthen each and every household that is represented here today, and even those that are not here that may be members of these people that are here today, I'm asking that you would reach out and strengthen those households. I'm asking that you would do this for your glory and for your honor. And Father, bless this ministry, even to the degree that there are individuals that reach out to them that they will know by testimonial fact and statement that it's working, that there is something that there is doing that is reaching out to the people, to the community, to the society, to the countries all over the world to let them know that you're able and to let them know that you are still God. We thank you. We stand on your promises today, God, and we count everything done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I want us to give, uh, I call him Pastor J. Allen, a big hand. Amen, because that was a message that's right now message for today. Amen. Right now message for today. And I just thank God because I, I got some serious nuggets out of that pastor because let me tell you something this 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 piece of coal right here is being pressured into a diamond and and that what you said right there that pressure produces the diamond i thank god because i love diamonds so i thank god for the pressure and i'm going to endure to the very end and I thank God that we will not despise what God is doing in, in this season, in this time. Because Amen. God's grace, like you said, is sufficient for everything that we're going through. Amen. You came to preach a message to us for Father's Day, but you blessed me because you added a message in there for the single moms when you told us the testimony about your mom. And that really encouraged me because that's what I do. Uh, come here, let me pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray about it, amen. There was a day when uh, it's just like the experience that you was uh, giving us the example about walking home from school and you reminded me so much of a time when, when my family and I, we were growing up in New York and my little sister, this was her first year in school and I'm like four or five years older than she is. So I had to walk her to school. And as we were walking to school, we got stopped by this gang. You know, in New York, they have a lot of gangs and stuff. Right. Yeah. And so we got stopped by this particular gang that was against the gang that I was in. And so they did. <laughs> and, and they began to bully me because here I am with my little sister walking to school and my brother, my older brother had already went ahead of us, you know. And they stopped us, and it was a scene just like you were saying. I mean, I was backed into a corner, and I tease my sister about this all the time. I said, Carolyn, when I was backed into that corner and I had to come out, you know, I didn't even have to swing a punch. It's just God just gave such a such a, a roar that came through me that I didn't even have to fight. But my sister's uh, braids, she had long Indian braids. They went doing. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, Carolyn, your braids stood right up on top of your head. That's the way I, I remember it. But I thank God for the calling of God that's on the life of God's people. Because regardless of what you go through and regardless of how hard it seems like it's never going to change, believe me, God has got you back. And the same Amen. way that he allowed the enemy to run David into that cave, he also allowed David to have all the help that he needed. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pastor. We got to have you back again to um, bring forth the word again to our congregation. I think everyone that was out there from every country, from Africa and Pakistan, the United States and Kuwait and every place that you have tuned in from, thank you from the bottom of my heart. God bless you. I pray that you have a wonderful Father's Day. And I know that you said your daughter took you out last night already for Father's Day. And I pray that every man on the face of the earth will be have a chance to enjoy that Father's Day. I'm Even though I spent most of my time with two sets of children as a single parent, my first husband died and I was a single parent. His second husband divorced and I was a single parent. But still, I know there is no comparison to the Father. Amen. So I give the fathers all of the praise today. Go out and enjoy yourself. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Amen.